Hello, good morning. Thank you for registering for the webinar supporting the next generation of CCUS projects, highlights of the USDA and DOE collaboration. I'm Michelle Littlefield, Program Coordinator with the USDA Consensus Program on building consensus on carbon capture, utilization and storage, and clean coal technologies. Um, this is a cooperative agreement with the Department of Energy, Fossil Energy. Uh, the program educates the public, policymakers, industry, and stakeholders on CCUS and clean coal technologies by hosting webinars such as this one, along with a series of monthly educational briefings, uh, conference workshops, technical reports, and we release monthly news clips of CCUS and clean coal related updates. If you would like to join our mailing list, if you have not done so already, feel free to send an email to the address at the bottom of the screen and we will add you to our subscriber list. Our program today uh, with our moderator, Mike Moore, director of the consensus program at USCA, is with Mr. Charles Zellick, special advisor to the assistant secretary for the USDOE Fossil Energy, and Mr. Chad Roop, administrator for rural utility services at USDA. Uh, we will center around the development and potential of the 2019 MOU, which recognizes the strategic importance of coal in the American energy portfolio and the potential for CCUS technology to protect the environment while stimulating job growth and economic developments in rural America. In the last 20 minutes of the webinar, we will have a Q&A session. If you have a question you would like to ask, please submit your question in the Q&A chat box in the bottom. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. And with that, I hand it over to Mike Moore. Uh, good morning, everybody, and or afternoon, actually, uh, here on the east side. Uh, thanks, everybody, for taking the time to be part of this uh, webinar with us. Uh, actually, looking at the attendees list, there's a lot of very familiar people out there in the crowd, so double thank you for those that I know and have worked with. Uh, I've had the pleasure of, of working with Chad and Chuck on a number of different fronts, and the work they've done with this MOU between the DOE and the USDA advance not only just CCUS, but other components that wrap around it and other areas of mutual interest between the two agencies is uh, it's quite a piece. And, and I think that uh, today's webinar will give some good rich insights to what they've put together, uh, will create ideas for going forward with new ideas and opportunities with CCUS and the other areas around it. With that, I'm gonna go ahead and, and turn this over to uh, Chuck to kick us off and uh, and on that, I'm going to stand back and Chuck, this is all yours, sir. And thank you very much for being here. All right. Thank you, uh, Mike. I appreciate it, Michelle. <clears throat> um, so as Mike had mentioned, my name's uh, Chuck Zellick. I'm a special advisor to the Assistant Secretary for Fossil Energy. And today I'd like to talk to you all about uh, a collaborative agreement or a through a memorandum of understanding that we put in place with the Department of Agriculture. You can go to the next slide. Uh, this is a screenshot of the press release from DOE, and USDA had one that looked very similar. Uh, DOE and USDA joined forces to increase energy technology development and deployment in rural America. This was released October 24th, or actually the MOU was signed October 24th of 2019. It was signed by Secretary Perry and Secretary Purdue. So this is a, a secretary to secretary MOU and it covers the entire department, not just fossil energy and rural uh, utility service. So although this particular talk is focused on CCUS, at least in my part, I'm gonna cover a little bit broader of a, a space to talk about um, you know, everything we're covering in this MOU. And you know, th this, this uh, relationship really started back in 2018 uh, in Scranton, Pennsylvania, uh, the Pennsylvania State Director for USDA, Kurt Cocodrilli, and I started to brainstorm about this. And you know, he he is an, uh, an administration appointee, and and you know, he saw the value in this proposition, and and really pushed the ball forward. So I'd, I'd like to acknowledge him starting off, uh, you know, right right up front. Um, you know, and, and also uh, the co-chairs for this. You know, what I'm about to talk about is. Chad Roop, the Administrator of uh, Rural Utility Service, and Lou Herkman, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Clean Coal and Carbon Management. Uh, they actually co-chair this and actually drive the overall effort. So, you know, again, what we've accomplished so far wouldn't have happened without those three individuals. So I just want to get that out front right off the bat. Um, you can go to the next slide. Okay, so the, the MOU was established in response to there was an executive order on rural prosperity back in 2017. Uh, a lot of people didn't hear about it. It talks about economic development in rural communities, and it actually aligns, I believe, 75 federal agencies. 
but energy does have a big role in that. So, you know, we saw that and we started to talk about what the opportunities were to take technologies that DOE develops and actually transition those into the commercial space. So that was the initial driver for the conversation. You know, and then of course the president had an executive order on energy infrastructure and economic growth in April of 2019, you know, that, that furthered the conversation. And then finally, this MOU was mandated in the 2018 Farm Bill that was actually released in 2019, section 6501. So it actually, it actually states that DOE and USDA will enter into an MOU, a memorandum of understanding. So we use that for, for the final kind of push over to Cliff um, to get this thing in place. You go to the next slide. You go, okay, uh, there's five objectives that are actually listed in the MOU. Um, and you know, this MOU is, is about on face value deploying energy technologies, but really what it's about is, is stimulating ep economic growth and prosperity in rural communities. So, you know, when you look at these five objectives, you, you need to put it in that perspective. So develop and expand energy and manufacturing related businesses, industries and technologies in rural America encourage investments in newer improved rural energy infrastructure, enhance access to capital for energy related businesses in industry in rural America, support rural community investments that anticipate growth associated with, with uh, manufacturing and energy, energy industry growth. This is very, a very important point because when we think about it from a DOE perspective, traditionally we've been concerned with, you know, uh, getting the technologies out the door, um, getting them deployed commercially, in a lot of these rural communities, one of the barriers is not so much the technology, the feasibility of the economic model for the technology, but it's also, I guess, the amenities that the communities have to offer to attract the workforce necessary to man those technologies, which is in USDA's mission space. So if you can think about that uh, from a broad perspective as the federal government, by aligning our resources, we're actually able to look at these issues collectively not only from the technology deployment perspective, but also the workforce that's necessary to man those technologies. And then the ability to track those workforces into those regions by providing them everything from movie theaters to hospitals to everything else that you, know, you can think of. And finally, encourage support and invest in cybersecurity initiatives uh, you know, and improvements. You can go to the next slide. Um, so where are we so far? current status and actions to date. So this thing was signed at the end of October. So we're about six and a half months in. Uh, key personnel have been identified from across both departments and an interdepartmental work group or an IWG was formed. Uh, also, we put an administrative structure has been established to implement the MOU. You know, my assistant secretary, Steve Wimberg, um, which many of you on this uh, webinar are probably familiar with, given the, given the subject matter, was very supportive of this and actually he was one of the key drivers with getting this in place. Um, I worked very closely with him and one of the things that he said when we put this in place was let's come up with some specific actions that, that stem off this MOU. I don't want this to be something that we sign and feel good about and it goes on a shelf. So we've actually worked very hard to put a structure in place to institutionalize this effort and institutionalize the channels of communication across the departments so we don't lose that. Um, and, and to make that a part of our day-to-day -day business. So five interdepartmental teams within the work group have been formed. And this will make sense uh, a little bit more as I go through the different projects we're looking at, but you know, we looked at energy industry, electric generation, and you know, obviously power plants. Energy industry, non-electric generation. So you can think there about, uh, I guess, items such as CO2 pipelines, CO2 storage sites, things that aren't inside the plant gate, but still have a need for funding. Um, also manufacturing, as that applies to fossil energy, we can talk about coal to product, we can talk about natural gas to product, value added products, um, bio-based products, things like that in the manufacturing sector. Critical infrastructure and cybersecurity obviously is an issue that needs no further uh, explanation. And we actually just stood up a fifth team uh, to focus on research, so we're very excited about that. We actually have broadened the net and actually pulled in additional organizations from both DOE and USDA into this structure. Um, so initially we identified 16 projects. Um, they've been aligned under the appropriate teams. And, and the challenge with coming up with the teams is you have to be responsive not only to what the MOU is asking for, or there's five points that I just went over on the previous slide, but also you have to think about 
USDA has a bunch of agencies. DOE has a bunch of uh, mission areas. Each one of those organizations or all those organizations have different programs. So in order to make this successful, you have to align the teams with not only the objectives of the memorandum of understanding, but you also have to make the teams functional by, I guess, creating them in such a way that they align with the programmatic resources that would support those efforts. So there was a lot of thought that went into this and hopefully that'll make more uh, sense to everybody as we go through this. Uh, you go to the next slide, Michelle. So this is the overall structure. Um, so we have several, and not all the agencies that are involved in this are, are, are caught within this, this chart. Um, we have USDA agencies and DOE program offices. We have the five groups across the bottom. So we have the Office of the Chief Scientist. Um, you know, that is out of the Office of the Secretary at USDA. They had a lot of the, uh, the bioenergy, bio-based products and, and that type of research. Actually, when I, if you read my bio, I was a senior economist at USDA uh, early 2000s and I was actually affiliated with, with, with that group. And there was efforts going on back then. If you look at Title 15 of the Farm Bill, that's basically the, that, well, that is the energy title that's where all the financial resources for energy are, you know, within the USDA programs for the most part. Um, you know, the Office of the Chief Scientist and the research that goes on there actually, you know, implements a lot of that, as well as Rural Utility Service and the rest of rural development. The Rural Business Service, um, that's an important agency. That's under the Rural Development Mission Area. Um, that's, I, I guess I couch that as the sister area. I'll let Chad go into that when he gets to that. But, uh, but basically, if you look at rural business service, rural utility service, and then what's not shown on here is the rural housing service, uh, rural business service funds, they, they have programs that have the ability to fund things that aren't generation or utilities, where rural utility service can look at power plants, they can look at water and sewer and things like that. And Chad is going to go into all that in his portion of the presentation. Uh, under DOE, we have, you know, most of our mission areas involved, the Office of Fossil Energy, which I'm a part of, uh, EERE, or the Renewable and Energy Efficiency Area, we have representatives from, from that, that office, the Office of Economic Impact and Diversity is involved, CSER, or the Office of Cybersecurity, and then the Office of Electricity, which deals with the grid and infrastructure. So, I mean, actually, we have, rep at the political level and the career level, we have representation from all these organizations across both departments, uh, participating in this MOU. Um, we meet quarterly, and as I mentioned, Chad uh, Roop, who's gonna go next, and, and Lou Herkman, uh, who I report to, actually co-chair this, so they oversee the whole thing. Um, so under these, these teams, you can see that each one of these offices intersect with those, but I'd, I'd mention a couple more, and I'll get into them a little more uh, as I go through the specific projects, but we also have the U.S. Forest Service involved, the Natural Resource Conservation Service involved. You know, there, there's several organizations, the Office of Technology Transfer for DOE, um, so you can go to the next slide. Okay, so this is just a sample of the projects or the, the mission areas that we have under those appropriate teams. So you green being manufacturing, the light blue, energy industry non-generation, and my screen's kind of blending together. I guess the, the colors aren't contrasting enough, but the top four boxes, I believe, are energy industry generation, and then the bottom one are critical infrastructure and cybersecurity. So as you can see, there's, there's a cross cut. This is an all and above uh, MOU. You know, we have input from all the DOE mission areas, um, including renewables and, and the Office of Electricity. Uh, this is an initial list that we came up with when this all started. One of the things that I wanted to put out, you know, as a result of this, and you know, my contact will be on here and, and Chad is gonna provide contact information at USDA. And several of you are, are familiar with Lou Herkman. Um, I would stress that you know, good ideas can come from anywhere. So if there are ideas for areas that, that you know, if somebody is out there with relevant experience, you know, with both departments, that they can think of ways to link these departments or, and where there's opportunities, we're all ears. Um, you know, that this is something that, that, you know, we're very interested in broadening. Um, so, you know, please contact one of us. So if you go ahead and, and advance, uh, Michelle, there are several projects on here, five, that actually have some relevance to CCUS. You can go ahead through all five of them. Um, the first one up top there on the left is the USDA DOE Small Business Administration Capital Access Forum Series. So we started this in Appalachia. And as, as you know, most of you know or might not know, a petrochemical industry or a, a petrochemical renaissance in Appalachia is one of not only the administration priorities, but also the department priorities. So we focused on, on hosting a series of events around Appalachia, around the northern panhandle of West Virginia, western Pennsylvania in Eastern Ohio, 
that actually, and, and we also brought the Small Business Administration into this, where we collectively looked at what we feel the opportunities are for petrochemicals in terms of new business opportunities and things like that, workforce development and other things. We looked at the resources that these three departments have available to, 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 to help uh, entrepreneurs and business owners participate in, in this industry. And then we hosted a series of events where we communicated what we'd see the opportunity being, and then also uh, communicated what federal resources are available to help businesses get started or expand. Uh, these were very well received. Uh, and the idea is initially we started in Appalachia. Um, we started on this particular topic, but as this thing continues, the vision is we, we have, we have a, a, a model for these events that work. We can perform analysis and we can identify opportunities no matter what the industry is. So in this case, it was petrochemicals. It can be for CCUS, it can be for the coal industry, whatever the topic is in the state we're looking at or the region. And then we can replicate this, this event and we can have these three departments come and, and, and travel a little bit and actually communicate these opportunities and make them relevant to whatever the issue is in this space in the region that we're, we're present in. The second one uh, is the CO2 pipeline network routing project. And you know, what we're doing there is we're actually taking a, a stab at modeling different pipeline configurations for, for CO2, uh, CCUS, and, and, and identifying industrial natural gas and coal facilities that would find it economic under various, various scenarios. You know, if, if you're familiar with DOE, we do a lot of that. And we could actually take those lists we can screen them for eligibility for what's of eligible, would be eligible for our US financing to do the CCUS portion. And then we can communicate that to, to USDA to help inform them as they're making investments and inform them as stakeholders are coming in and talking to them. Uh, the next one is the Energy Agriculture Water Nexus Drought Mitigation Effort. This was one of the first projects that I was involved with. And you know, my history was I worked at the Natural Resource Conservation Service, who so we actually cost share uh, conservation practices on agricultural operations. So if you look at the year 2013 out west, there was a significant drought. You know, we talk about the water energy nexus. There were cases where there was thermal power generation that actually had they, uh, irrigation water had to be diverted from irrigation districts, like the, the Laramie River generating station is a good example of that. So basically, water had to be diverted, which which can penalize the ag sector. So the question is, is if USDA with these conservation programs, with these water conservation programs, could actually identify drought prone watersheds where the ag operations coexist with thermal power generation. And if they can focus irrigation efficiency, for instance, things like that where power plants are in direct competition with the ag sector for water, you could actually move that drought threshold and you could make it to where it would take a more significant drought to impact or where you'd have to make resource use choices. So we're actually taking, well, and I'll get into this in a bit, but we're taking that information and we're incorporating it into NRCS's ranking tools. Um, so the next one is a carbon capture utilization and storage task force. Uh, we actually have a group specifically focused on how to deploy CCUS technologies and also just address the other issues that come up around that technology and actually bring uh, USDA into the fold. The final one is existing coal plant efficiency improvements. This one, and, and this actually, at the time we were putting this together, uh, it was on the tail of the, the clean power plan, and now the ACE regulation, you know, is out, it's under litigation. Um, but, but basically, the idea is, is uh, you know, existing plants that would have to comply and do efficiency improvements, probably to a large extent, don't know that they can go for financing for those improvements through the rural utility service. So actually, part of this is geared at uh, identifying through analysis which plants and what technologies might be feasible candidates to do efficiency improvements under various scenarios and providing that information to USDA to help them make decisions when people come and approach them to do these projects. So you can go to the next slide. Hey Chuck, just before you start that next slide, uh, somebody popped up a quick question. I won't do this later on, but it was pertinent because of the subject matter you're in right now. And they were asking if you have all any of the IWG programs for alternative uses of coal, for example, to fabricate value-added projects. And I, oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I we certainly do. Yes. It felt appropriate at the time. If you can go back, uh, Michelle, one slide, I believe. Uh, I didn't go through this list exhaustively, but if you look in the green, 
in the third box down, natural gas and coal-based products manufacturing. So that, that's in the manufacturing team, and that is geared towards looking at things like carbon fiber, uh, you know, carbon-based foam, things like that, where we have an interest in coal, but, you know, it, it isn't necessarily power generation. Uh, and, and something else I'd mention too, just to expand on that, is, is with the energy non-generation team, a lot of that's about resource extraction as well. So, I mean, we, you know, coal mining, unconventional oil and gas, you know, USDA has, and Chad could expand this, it's north of 40 programs. Uh, they're very versatile. I mean, and, you know, it was interesting to me, and, and just, just to frame this, when I came from USDA to DOE, and I mentioned USDA, you know, a comment that I received, and this was 10 years ago, was, well, they don't have any money. And I thought, really? I mean, USDA, rural development, the organization that Chad's a member of, if they were a private bank, they'd be the fourth largest bank in the country. I think they have over a $260 billion loan portfolio, and a lot of that's in power. Um, so, yes, we can look at that, and, and we're looking for ideas. So if anybody has ideas, you know, again, my contact information is at the end. I'm happy to, to, to enter into conversations with anybody. Uh, you can go ahead, uh, Michelle. Did that address the question, I guess, sufficiently? Uh, I hope so. Okay. Um, so, progress to date. Uh, you know, we've been actively communicating USDA programmatic resources to DOE stakeholders. Just a couple, this is an example. I mean, Chad Roop has been gracious enough, uh, the administrator of Rural Utility Service. I mean, this is a high level individual and he's wanted to come on here to talk to, to our stakeholders for the most part about the programs that they have available in our mission space. Um, you know, uh, the assistant administrator, Chad's assistant, uh, Chris McLean, he's been to several DOE events relevant to CCUS and actually presented, and that is a function of the relationship that we developed through this MOU. We've conducted two of these Appalachian Access to Capital events. Um, you know, and just an interesting side story, our last one was in Wheeling, West Virginia. It was March 11th, you know, and it was right before the COVID outbreak. And, you know, it was just a, a good story is I had a lot of people through, you know, not necessarily energy related, but through the access to the, to the program managers that they had from all three states in an event like that, when the shutdowns occurred, they immediately know who to go to for the Paycheck Protection Program and the different types of disaster assistance programs that, that are available through these other departments. Um, so, you know, I, it was really successful. Um, we've engaged with NRECA uh, and rural cooperatives on cybersecurity and threat information sharing. Uh, we facilitated involvement and got USDA to table for the 45Q tax credit process. So actually we provided a briefing to their staff on 45Q and uh, then when comments were, were requested, we actually engaged with them and, and facilitated the incorporation of their comments you know, into that process. Um, we also, uh, you know, within the Office of Fossil Energy, there's a quarterly CCUS interagency work group composed of USGS and EPA and other departments. Uh, USDA Rural Utility Service has a seat at the table now. So we brought that into the fold there. You go to the next uh, slide. This is an interesting one. We've engaged with the Forest Service and the Office of Electricity. You know, one of the, the things that we're looking at is, is, I guess, the probability or the increased risk of vegetation, vegetation leaning against uh, transmission and distribution lines out west and starting forest fires. Significant risk. And actually, there is a group under this MOU looking at that across both departments. Um, integrating DOE thermal power generation data into USDA NRCS CART ranking tool. Or drought mitigation. That's what I mentioned. Um, you know, the idea there is, and in particular, if you're going to do a CCUS project and you have a once through cooling system or, you know, whatever cooling system you have, if you buy the fact that you have a parasitic load and your water demand might increase, if you can partner with the local ag producers to, to reduce their water footprint, you know, it actually might increase the amount of water that, that one of these projects has available to do, you know, an additional project. And I, I can't remember the specific plant, but I remember uh, one plant, I believe it was in Nebraska. They had to buy 33,000 acres just to procure the water rights that they thought would be necessary to do an expansion of that plant. Uh, so it's a significant issue out West. Um, and then to me, this is one's near and dear because uh, it was just a huge uh, lift. We actually established an administrative infrastructure and an accountability system across both departments. So actually we have a group at USDA that's hosting this We've developed an entire reporting system, uh, you know, a, a standard operating procedure on how to report progress on projects, how to make changes to projects. You know, if you can imagine, I mean, looking at that org chart, it's not just 
within DOE across the program offices, it's across two departments and all the mission areas. That, that's, a, that's a big lift. And we just had a webinar on that yesterday to train up the leadership on how to, how to proceed with that. Um, and I guess you go to the next slide. And I don't want to take more time from Chad because I really think people are uh, here, here what's available through USDA. So this is my contact information. If you have any, you know, after this webinar is over, if there's any uh, desire to, to, uh, to discuss further, to, to be involved, you know, if you're a Fed, you know, within DOE or, or USDA, you know, please contact me. I'm happy to talk to anybody. We're, we're, uh, I, I, one thing I can say about this group, with this leadership group with Chad and Lou, uh, Herman, Know, Kurt and, and some of these other folks, it's been, it's been a pleasure working with them because they're very progressive and they're very willing to think outside the box to get things done that benefit taxpayers. And that's very refreshing. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to Chad. Well, thanks, Chuck. I uh, definitely concur. The relationship that we have is, is vital to being able to move projects forward. Uh, it's very easy to work with folks when you can uh, have a, a common bond and most there's several people on this call who uh, are from my home state of Wyoming, and it's a place that I dearly love. Uh, but more importantly, is when you look at uh, throughout the United States in so many rural areas, uh, we have a common bond, especially in uh, rural Pennsylvania and rural West Virginia and uh, rural Ohio. And so when we came together originally as, as state directors in, in those areas within USDA. We, we found opportunities to collaborate and find the uh, path forward that the president has talked about for these rural areas that have been hit so hard uh, from the uh, war on coal. And so this gave us an opportunity to be able to take something and, and uh, make lemonade out of lemons and, and really do something positive for these rural communities. And so uh, being able to, to take this and leverage it out and, and create a, a true opportunity for rural communities is so important. Uh, from my background as a banker, I think uh, one of the important things that we do is we, we look at it from a, a finance standpoint and we always look at risk and we look at how to mitigate risk and how we can uh, have confidence in what we do. And I think in, in running a, a taxpayer funded bank, if you will, it's important that we take that into account. So um, getting unbiased research is so important as we look to move forward and, and getting that from the experts in the industry is critical. And so with Chuck and his crew and with what Lou uh, has done, that gives us the ability to reach back to somebody who has an unbiased opinion that can give us the research behind something and say, this is ready for commercialization or this is not. And then we as the bankers can, can identify it, the eligibility criteria to be able to move forward. Uh, more importantly is that we do it in the path that the secretary and the president see is, is important. And so um, the secretary earlier this year released an ag innovation agenda and he talked about increasing production and reducing carbon emissions. And so while one may not traditionally think of the Department of Agriculture as handling so much of this, uh, there is a component here where we have a, a massive opportunity to influence uh, this agenda that he's got. And so uh, when you look at what we do and what we've done over the years, there's opportunity here to really move the ball forward and bring all of these things together. And this MOU does that. It, it gives us that path forward in a somewhat non-traditional way. Um, it's not just RUS, but it's also uh, rural business and cooperative service. And then in a certain ex extent, rural housing service. We hit the, the full gamut. When you look at uh, the reason we have a, a rural town, this one happens to be in South Dakota, of a community, we're going to hit every area of that community with opportunities and be able to provide options for people who live there. Uh, the things that, that I do with inside of rural utility service are uh, the electric program, which has been around since the 1930s under FDR when it came into being under the New Deal to our water program uh, to, and that hits the drinking water, uh, sanitary sewer, solid waste. And then we've also have our telecom program, which in today's technology that really turns into broadband. And, and hopefully most folks on this call have, have uh, heard that call to action that we've seen as a result of this pandemic. Our programs can 
move across agencies though. So it's not just getting fiber to the home, it's making the grid stronger, it's making it more efficient, more effective, more resilient, being able to respond to power outages, uh, being able to get the middle mile fiber put in the ground and make it truly effective so that uh, these areas that have been left behind for so many years, for decades, can catch up and get an opportunity to do things that uh, before it was restricted to areas that only had those services. Much like the 1930s and 1940s, when electricity came to the farm uh, under uh, FDR and, and later Truman and in, in my area, even under Eisenhower and, and a little, little bit later for some of us. So, uh, and those needs are still today. There's a lot of areas in the United States that s still lack affordable power. And so as we look at these advances in technologies, when we talk about things that are new technologies that can help advance the grid, we have to understand the demand on the grid and the requirement to meet that demand on a timely basis it doesn't do us any good to have something that is not dispatchable and not deployable that uh, will only work sometimes. That is fine to have and that's great, but we have to be able to meet the demand of our economy all of the time. And so that's uh, why this is such an important issue. And also meet the environmental needs that we, re that we uh, are mandated to, to uh, fulfill. So if we can go ahead and move to the next slide. I would appreciate it, thank you. Um, so, like I mentioned, we're the successor to the Rural Electrification Administration, and within that over $200 billion bank that we have, I manage about $62 billion. $46 billion of that's in the electric program, and $13 billion in water, and then although telecom is our smallest program, that has seen a huge growth, and we've been very focused on trying to build out broadband in rural America. Part of that broadband, like I mentioned before, is the middle mile fiber. So working with uh, Chuck and his crew over at the um, Office of Electricity, we've been able to identify gaps and provide a more durable electric grid by finding opportunities to take our borrowers, connect them into those opportunities, and also build out last mile broadband in certain respects where there's a need. And we're finding that the electric cooperatives and other providers are very much engaging this idea and trying to build out into these areas and make it affordable uh, because so many of these areas were passed by just due to a lack of uh, capital structure to uh, create the incentive to get there. Um, in our programs, we often uh, look at renewable energy, but we also finance coal-based power plants, coal-fired power plants. Uh, that is something that is fundamental base load power that uh, exists within our portfolio today. So we have to be sure that we understand that from a banking perspective, how do we continue to provide power throughout the grid for both intermittent and base load power. And so we've got to be able to do all of the things that are needed and required of our borrowers to meet that demand. One of the great things about our program is we get about five and a half billion dollars a year uh, in authority to be able to run just the electric program. And we put out up to about $9 billion a year in overall rural utility service uh, through those three major agencies. But five and a half billion dollars a year is run on a negative subsidy, which means it does not require any taxpayer funds to run that part of the program short of the SE, the salaries and expenses. So we don't require special appropriations to be able to deploy generation, transmission, and distribution, including smart grid. That is a wonderful thing because that says that our borrowers are very strong. You look at most rural electric cooperatives and they're very well funded. They're, they're strong borrowers uh, and they're trying to find the best opportunities they can to deploy the best service that they can, whether that be electric or whatever fits within that member services area. So. Uh, not having to go to Congress every year and say, hey, we need more money is a great way to be able to help expand on some of these programs. Uh, being a federal agency, we are re uh, required to report to the Office of Management and Budget, so not all things fit within the box. And uh, anytime you bring something new to the table, whether it be a technology or a new way of doing business, all of those things have to be reviewed. So this partnership is critical to that. It helps us get the unbiased background to be able to support 
going to OMB and saying, hey, we've got this program that fits within our authority and we'd love to do it. Um, we've got to make sure that as a bank, we're wired tight when we do that. So uh, having discussed that piece of it, I would like to go ahead and move forward because I think uh, we want to talk a little bit more on, on uh, the electric grid piece of this. Um, as I mentioned before, we handle a lot of different aspects uh, when it comes to all things rural utilities. Um, but one thing I would definitely want to focus on and bring your attention to is when we talk about eligibility, we are the rural utilities service. And what that means is that we are by statute providing service for electric programs to populations of under 20,000. So if you've got a generation plant that is selling to the market, you better have some uh, power purchase agreements in place that show that you are selling the majority of your power that's generated out of that plant to rural America. Um, so if you want access to these funds, and I'm going to show you a little bit, a chart a little bit later that is a little bit dated, but, but gives you a, a good read on the value proposition that this brings, is that you, you have to meet those statutory requirements. Um, we're as flexible as we can be, being uh, a federal agency and being a, a bank, if you will, but uh, we've, we've got to be able to meet those requirements to justify continuing to have a negative subsidy and being good stewards of taxpayer funds. So um, aside from being financially and technically feasible uh, and the technical feasibility coming from the analysis by DOE, uh, we we want to make sure it meets the five C's of credit in traditional banking. So uh, if we could, next slide, please, Michelle. Thank you. One thing that is unique about uh, the electric program and really the telecom program is we're an incentive lender. And that, what that means is that you don't have to go out and get turned down by some commercial bank to be able to come forward and do business with us. If you meet the requirements of our program and you want to do business with us, and you meet our general eligibility criteria, we will um, be happy to engage in conversation. Uh, we've got publicly traded companies who do business with us all the way down to distribution cooperatives, uh, investor owned utilities, all kinds of different methods of doing business. We've got tribal uh, authorities who we do business with and in municipalities as well. So again, we try to be very flexible. We are a balance sheet lender. What that means is that we're not going to finance a project and take all of the risk on an individual project, such as CCUS. We are going to be take a banking perspective and try and reduce as much risk for the taxpayer as we can. So if we have an existing relationship with a, a rural utility service borrower, uh, we will take a, a, all the assets and all of the, the backing of that entity to uh, make sure that we reduce the risk to finance that project moving forward. We want to make sure that we put everyone in the best position to, to succeed. And part of that is making sure that uh, we are properly structured. Because again, when we go to the Office of Management and Budget and say, we'd like to do this project, we're going to do everything we can to reduce the risk to the taxpayer and make sure that we are advancing technology as best we can. Um, so let's go ahead and move on to the next slide, please. As you can see by our footprint, by having been around since the 1930s, we uh, have a massive impact on the United States. And a lot of these areas are areas where, although you may not be uh, generating the power, you are receiving the power. And the grid is so integrated anymore that more than likely you probably have fossil based energy power coming through your system and into your home. And there is a need for baseload power in our grid, uh, we have to ensure that we support that to get you what you need. A lot of rural communities are dependent upon single source economies and some of those are coal based power plants and we've seen a lot of impact on rural based communities and we have to acknowledge the impact on those communities and give them a path forward. So this is one method to be able to show sustainability and keep rural America at work. Nobody takes pride in the fact that uh, people are seeing massive unemployment right now due to this uh, virus. We want to make sure that people have the ability to go back to work, go to back to work quickly, and get back on track with the best economy we've seen in my lifetime. I think that's, that's critical. So we're going to do everything we can to support that. Can move forward, please. Um, 
like I mentioned, we have um, uh, about five and a half million dollars that goes out the door every year and we impact the entire United States. It's not just the electric infrastructure loan program, but we also have a relending program that uh, we just opened the window on for uh, what's called the 313A, where we finance uh, loans to uh, financial institutions that can further uh, push out that money to areas of needs. Um, and that's $750 million a year that goes out through that program. Additionally, the Rural Energy Savings Program has recently changed. We've just updated a, a, a regulation with that and you can take that funding and now do on-bill financing for energy efficiency. It's not just electric efficiency, it's energy efficiency. We see opportunity there with natural gas to be able to um, provide financing to homeowners so that they can convert from something that is a higher cost delivery of heat to a lower cost, such as natural gas, to be able to, to um, gain, uh, gain uh, or reduce costs and gain a, a better net income in those areas. So those are some of the things that we look to do. And then the high energy cost program is something that uh, really is unique, quite frankly, for mostly Alaska. Uh, where they're taking this high cost uh, diesel fuel and things like that that they power their systems with and, and let them uh, find an alternative way of doing power through the research that DOE has provided. So uh, if we can, that just gives you a, an overall view of rural utilities service under the electric program. And if you could move forward, Chuck, or <laughs> Michelle, sorry. <laughs> Uh, this information, here's the value proposition. When you talk about uh, interest rates, these are January's rates, but recently uh, they're down as low as 1.41% and that for a 30 year treasury. If you take that, add an eighth to it, that's the type of fixed rate lending that we're talking about. And when you're talking about billions of dollars of every year, there is an absolute incentive for people to do the best they can to reduce their costs so that they can do more with less and provide the best service possible. So that's the value proposition that Rural Utilities brings to the table. So next slide, please. And this just kind of gives you a general breakdown. Again, this is January's data. We're now up to $46 billion in a portfolio. We've had good growth here over the last uh, year as we take projects that we've obligated and turn them into uh, reality in the ground. So. Um, we're continuing to move forward. The, the COC is a cushion of credit. That's a savings account that is starting to, if you will, uh, get reduced as people convert that over with uh, pay downs on their deals. So that gives you an idea of the net portfolio. Next slide, please, Michelle. This is a list of our coal-based power plants who we currently do business with. Um, it's something we are a, if you will, a public institution. So we have um, the the somewhat of a uh, responsibility for, for transparency, uh, as long as we can protect PPI. But I think what's important to know is that we do do this today. We finance coal. It's not something that is unique. It is well within our authority. And it, the question is, is how do we provide the best sustainability to provide the full needs of the economy and the electric power base? If all we did is retire coal plants, uh, we would not be serving those communities well. We would not be serving the nation well. And we wouldn't be taking advantage of science and advancing technology to reduce carbon emissions and working with DOE gives us that potential. So next slide, please. This gives you a, a little bit of the background on what we're doing. Um, everybody's probably here familiar with Petronova. We've got a few more projects. And so quite frankly, um, Dr. Zellick and his crew have been really good about giving us uh, leads on potential opportunities. And uh, Mike and his crew have, have made good introductions. Um, so it gives us a great opportunity to entertain discussions, see what we can do, find opportunity, uh, but most importantly doing things like this is educating people on why we're doing it and give opportunities to where we can bring that to realization, all areas of the nation that have a need for a sustainable economy. Next slide, please. We don't just focus on CCUS. We take all technologies and help them advance. Uh, so when we're looking at something, CCUS is very important uh, here to this group, but we look at 
um, batteries, we look at solar, we look at wind, we look at natural gas. We find all different technologies that we can bring forward uh, to integrate them into the grid. We do a lot of financing on renewables, on natural gas. In fact, I just uh, financed one uh, last week um, at, at for a new generation plant. And so it's something that we take this uh, very seriously and we wanna have full integration across the board. So we're not just focusing in on one resource or trying to support one uh, industry. We want to make sure everything advances because again, you have to have the full spectrum of provision for the electric grid. You have to have dispatchable power. It is a requirement of the industry and a requirement of the economy. And if we don't have that, there is no way we'd have a manufacturing base. So um, if we could go ahead and move forward, please. If you would like to reach out to us, feel free to reach out to Chris McLean. He's the assistant administrator for electricity in this program, and he's the career employee that will uh, help assist you in moving these deals forward. And he and his team have many, many years of experience working on these types of projects. So with that, uh, Mike, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. All right, <clears throat> Chad and Chuck, guys, thanks very much. And a lot of, a lot of information here, and please follow up with, uh, both, both entities have given you contact information on uh, how to get back in touch with them. We've got a couple of questions that have popped up from our participants. Um, I'm gonna hit those and I've got a couple of, as well here. One of them is, um, is the MOU partnership supported by its own budget for the overall effort and the projects that are targeted? Is, there, is, it, is, is it kind of self-budgeted or how's that structured between the two of you? Uh, I mean, I can, I can take that question. I mean, it, it does not have its own budget. Um, okay. Th that's one of the, uh, I, I think it's really innovative and actually, again, it's, it's uh, reflective of the leadership we have right now is, and, and, you know, we don't have special programs to do this. We don't have a budget to do the administrative work. I mean, we had to be creative and leverage federal staff. We have limited contractor support, uh, you know, for, you know, justifying it, by, by, you know, through the coal program uh, by pursuing coal projects. Um, but, you know, the, the, the programs that we have available are the programs that were statutorily, uh, you know, allocated to us uh, through congressional action, um, you know, the, the farm bill, uh, you know, the research programs at DOE. Uh, so what we've had to do is actually go back and look at the language for those programs and figure out where, you know, those interlocking fields of fire are and where the opportunities are for us to start communicating. Um, mm -hmm. You know, ideally, you know, DOE takes a technology up to a certain point and then, you know, it's, it's missionary, it has to back off. And they call that, 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 that space between then and when it goes commercial, the valley of death. But that's exactly why communicating with USDA is so important because then, you know, they can come in and actually if, they're re if that technology is ready for commercial deployment, using their existing programs, they can pick that up. So sure. uh, it, it's been very effective. Okay. You know, while I've got your attention, um, one other quick question that popped up is how is the DOE Loan Program Office involved with this partnership and MOU as well? As a matter of fact, uh, that's a great question. And I overlooked that when I was going through the org structure. We're very plugged in with the Loan Program Office and not only the section great. of fossil assets, but also renewables and, and everything else. Actually, I just arranged a meeting with a potential methanol project in Louisiana uh, with our loan program office. So first we met with USDA and we right. looked at you know, what, what resources were available. The one thing that I would throw out here um, that's important to know is that, you know, if you're a DOE, at least from what I understand, if you're a FOA recipient, you can't get a loan guarantee from DOE and an FOA at the same time, but there's nothing prohibiting you from getting an FOA at DOE and then going on and getting a loan guarantee through USDA. So if we okay. have capital, that's one of the things we're looking at. You know, not a lot of people know most coal mines are going to qualify for a small business administration program. That's $5 million. You can go business and industry through USDA for $25 million and then potentially get an FOA or there's no cap on, on administrator roots programs to a large extent. So looking at how to be creative to stack those resources actually, you know, could be significant in helping some of these projects, you know, get off the ground. And, and we're actually actively looking for some candidate projects where we can kind of do proof of concept on that. Sure. And Mike, uh, just to add into that a little bit as well, um, within our authority um, into that five and a half billion dollars that we get every year, uh, mm -hmm. 
electric program, it is specifically stated in statute that up to $2 billion can be utilized for CCUS. It's actually carbon storage utilization and sequestration. So um, it's, it's, you know, when you start getting into taking it and converting those materials into something other than EOR or storage, that's where you get more into the rural business and cooperative service rather than our U.S. Uh, so right. we're going to find on, on at what point our U.S. Can, can finance a deal versus it taking it to that next level. But oftentimes these projects can have multiple financing sources to come to realization. And, and I sense just from what we've heard so far that there's a lot of, there's a lot of pieces that are available to, if you take the time to try to connect the dots on them. I, 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 I've got, my imagination is running on some of the things I've seen in the past that could be applicable here. Uh, well, I've got your attention, uh, Chad, who's eligible uh, for funding? Is it munis, uh, co-ops, investor-owned utilities? Really, it comes down to anyone who is uh, eligible under our rural utilities electric program. So it can be any of the above. Um, the main point is, are they serving rural America? Um, right. Do they have power purchase agreements in place? Uh, do they have a, an established situation? I mean, it's, we're very willing to take on new borrowers. We do that. Uh, we're more than happy to do that. But quite frankly, the, the, the equity that they bring to the table is very important to these deals. The maximum we can finance is 75% of a project. That's Somebody, the um, it's very good to know on how that would play out. The um, one of the questions that have just popped up: Are there any collaborations with the Appalachian Regional Commission for projects in Appalachia? Uh, I'll take that one. I mean, at this point, uh, th I, I believe they're aware. Um, we, we actually worked with them. Uh, the report's still in process or progress uh, in response to that the president's executive order on. Uh, Appalachia economic opportunities. Um, so the ARC, ARC was involved in that paper and we discussed this agreement in that paper. Uh, right. you know, our, our, I guess our, our approach right now though, is we've been trying to, to I, I think, and I'm an ex-military guy, Chad's a West Pointer, we, we need to have a process in place and then we start to open up because if we get too many, you know, and I'm not saying that, I mean, we, we have, we have uh, we've collaborated with several departments, but, but uh, especially with COVID, we kind of drew back in and focused on getting the infrastructure in place. So ARC is, you know, yes, that, that is an organization we'd be very, uh, I guess, very looking forward to, to working with. Right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw another one out here. Um, the RUS programs, are they also an option for pipeline and, and, the, and storage or EOR and associated, associated with the CCUS projects? And I think you probably covered a bit of that already, but I'd just ask it again. Sure. Um, part of it is the specific statutory language and what that means. So if you're you're taking and putting it into the ground, right. uh, regardless of whether it's enhanced oil recovery or if it's for storage, the way we viewed that statutory uh, language is that that is something that's eligible under the RUS electric program. If you're taking and, and putting it into something else or if it's based off a non-electric generation facility that doesn't normally qualify for uh, rural utilities electric program, then, right. then it would not qualify. Uh, we could help with the things that are happening at the plant, right. but when you start talking about the pipeline and the purpose of that pipeline and where it's going, that can change the nature of that portion of the project. Sure. As far as yeah. eligibility. So, so I can think of a couple of things off the top of my head, things like Project Tundra, which is based around Minnesota's uh, cooperative up there. You've got uh, Farmington, New Mexico, and and mm -hmm. San Juan, and and all those areas of interest that just may play into. You've got uh, a number of projects that are, I think are being discussed up in Illinois right now, and and who knows what else has got that could be connected to all this. Um, is there a question I should ask you that I haven't asked you? Um. Frankly, no. <laughs> I think we've covered quite a bit. Um, you know, uh, I'll be a little bit transparent. You know, some of the stuff we are developing, I just had conversations this week with my team. Um, right. Because although we've done 
projects like this in the past, um, it's been a little while. And so, um, you know, understanding what our what the policy is, they, these guys come to me and say, hey, what do we do about this? And so some of those things we're working on and, and we may not have all the answers directly up front right now for everyone, but we're willing to engage and explore and, and try and find a good solution. Right. The, um, the work for, I, I would, I would, I'm going to step out a little bit. I believe Project Tundra is some, is a, is a, is a program that's been worked on for a while. That is it, is it something that is, um, in, in been to your shop, so to speak, that can be discussed? I, I'm asking more to kind of get an idea if something like Well, I'd rather not get into the specifics on an individual project. Um, Mike, and I apologize for, for interrupting you. I didn't mean to, but um, I, I don't want to get into a specific project or sure. a discussion on that in this forum. I think that would be inappropriate. Um, sure, of course, of course. You know, we have a lot of ongoing discussions with, with interested parties. You bet. Uh huh. Well, it's it's good to uh, good to know, and I think that um, I have one question here that uh, I, actually it's uh, Dick Pajura, and it was, what are the major areas? where agriculture needs the energy sector to improve its performance on either withdrawing water or rejecting water with regard to energy generation process. It's a little bit out, but uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I take a long time. I think it's a, there's, a, there's always good purpose to his questions. Sure. Uh, okay, so, so basically a question like that, and one of the biggest challenges with answering a question like that is, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm involved with a group called the National Drought Resilience Partnership. So it's co-chair uh -huh. USDA and EPA, but Department of Defense, Homeland Security, NIDAS, there, there's Interior, all involved, talk about drought response from the federal government. And most of the projections that we do have to rely on an assumption about what the weather is going to do. And the areas that end up having problems are dependent on those assumptions. And you know, right. the joke I'm always making, I got corrected by somebody from NOAA, but I said, you know, the weatherman can't tell me if it's gonna rain tomorrow, but I'm gonna tell you if we're gonna have a drought this summer, right? I mean, and I was quickly corrected, there's a difference between weather and climate, and I get it. Um, I'm an economist, so, uh, but, uh, you know, basically what we do is we run this model over and over again, giving different assumptions and look at the distribution of where those drought events occur and where those conflicts happen. So, you know, obviously, west of the Mississippi, uh, Sandia National Laboratory has a water availability database and a projection through 2030. We've incorporated that database. And then we impose drought events uh, based on the USDA drought monitor, the frequency and things like that. Uh, we looked at, and there's a paper out there, and if you get in touch with me after this, uh, after this event, I'm happy to share a copy with you. I actually presented it at the International Soil and Water Conservation Society uh, conference in Pittsburgh this summer, this last summer. Um, we looked at the Ogallala watershed, and I can tell you where the conflicts occurred, you know, the Dave Johnson plant, the Gerald Gentleman plant, uh, you know, there were several plants in the West, Wyoming, Nebraska, you know, in, in the West, um, depending on the severity of the drought. But I'll put it in perspective, you know, I go to sit at this NDRP event, or this, this meeting, quarterly meeting, and Interior is saying they're, they're uh, you know, they're, they're expecting a significant water shortage, you know, a drought event, you know, in the next two years. And then I have Homeland Security say, well, wait a minute, we just got a briefing where, uh, you know, in, in the event of a power outage, hydro is going to be what produces power for our national security installations. That's a problem, right? So really, everybody talks about the bomb cyclone in the East Coast and the vulnerability of the power system to that. I would argue, and I'm happy to share that paper, based on our analysis, the West drought is the bomb cyclone. We actually... Right. Scenarios. Mike, I apologize. I have to drop off for another call, but uh, I appreciate everyone's time today, and um, thank you very much. So, Chad, thank you very, very much. And I think what I'll uh, and again, I can't thank you enough for the time you took today, Chad. I know you're very busy. Keep up the great work. Everybody know how to find Chad's uh, office to the uh, the uh, the, attack, the program today will be posted. Uh, so, Chad, thanks very, very much. Thank you very much. Take care. Yep. Thank you. I'll just ahead. finish my thought real quick. I mean, basically, uh, you know, Western states, water rights is a huge issue. Uh, you know, and that's something we ran in, into early. Uh, like if you look at the, the Petronova project or uh, 
you know, in, in Texas, they actually procured the water pumping station on the Brazos from the rice irrigation district. So you got 7,000 acres of rice farmers, which is highly water intensive surrounding that facility. They had a drought event where that project specifically did not, uh, did not experience a water shortage because the water board had the reservoir up the river release water to supply that plant, but they owned another asset. I think it was the limestone coal plant that actually did have to curtail. So what right. we found was if you get into situations where coal plants in particular that have large uh, water demands for once through cooling, and if there's a shortage and they have to buy water rights, that incremental cost, their economics were so fragile, they end up shutting down. So right. I, I, I can't really get into specifics on the call, but uh, I'm happy to share the paper or engage in conversation with anybody who's interested because this is a significant issue. I have a, I think that uh, um, Dick know, will know how to find you for more information on that. It was a great insight. I hadn't really put those pieces together. Um, at the end of the day, there's programs here that I think a lot of people aren't aware of between DOE and the, and the uh, uh, USDA's rural utility services. There's, there's opportunity for creative thinking, connecting dots, strong demand to support rural America with, uh, with power and resources and, and jobs. And so uh, I guess Chad's not here to finish this off with me, but uh, I think what I would say is that uh, you're open for business uh, be creative and uh, knock on their doors. And with that, Chuck, thank you very much for your time. And uh, Michelle, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Mike. Um, um, and a big thank you to our guests uh, for that in-depth discussion of the MOU and what it means for rural American energy and beyond. Um, and to our viewers who are listening in, we're looking forward to seeing more results and developments uh, of this very promising partnership with USDA and DOE. Um, our next webinar will be on June 10th, uh, continuing the CCUS discussions uh, with two new guest speakers. Uh, please look for an announcement in the coming weeks for webinar details. And in the, in the meantime, I hope everyone is being safe and healthy, and we'll see you all next time. Thank you very much. So long, and thank you all very much for taking the time.